All right, everybody. Um, we are beginning the last unit of the year. This is on the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire is chock full of really interesting, crazy stuff. This unit is action-packed, um, and you're going to see a lot of that action-packed stuff. Really interesting, crazy stuff, starting today with Roman leadership. Okay, so after the debacle, that's a fancy word I just threw at you debacle debacle means like disaster so after the debacle due to the effects of the punic war and rome conquering new lands there's a lot of reformers that try to improve the conditions of rome over the next 100 years so what i'm talking about is when we last left the romans there was that whole effects of roman conquest so you had the small farmers that were forced to sell their farms to the patricians who turned them into latifundias. The farmers thought they could get a job at the latifundias. Turns out the patricians um, were buying slaves and there was an increase in slavery due to the victory at Punic War III with the Carthaginians. The farmers take the little money they have. They can't get a job on the farm. The only place they can afford to live is the city of Rome. So they move there and there's no farms there. So it leads to the farmers selling their votes to politicians and it leads to more corruption and things like this. Well, there is a guy that wants to stop this. The first person that we're going to talk about that tries to stop all this madness is Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. Yes. Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. So he says that none of this corruption would be going on if small farmers got to keep their land. So he says the trouble started when small farmers were forced to sell their lands after the Punic War. So he becomes tribune, and you'll remember a tribune is that person in the assembly that kind of looks out for the rights of plebeians and the farmers are plebeians. So Tiberius has this very powerful position and he gets the assembly to start voting on things like they should limit the amount of land a person could own. He's trying to get rid of the latifundias. It's his mission that if they get rid of the latifundias, and the patricians are forced to break up the latifundias, those small farmers could go back to the farm, and then there goes the corruption in Rome. But there's a big problem. You know who doesn't want to stop the corruption in Rome? That would be the Senate. So, um, I'll talk more about that in a second. So, as I mentioned, he wants to divide up the latifundias and give some of the land back to the poor, and the assembly is all for it because that's that's... A lot of plebeians. They're like, yeah, break up the latifundias. The small farmers need to get back to farming. That will get rid of all this corruption. Well, the Senate doesn't want the corruption to stop. Now, the Senate doesn't approve of this because those 300 men are patricians. A lot of those senators own the latifundias and they're using their money to pay the farmers to vote certain ways. So if the farmers got their small farms back, the Senate wouldn't be able to pass the kind of laws it wants to pass. So what ends up happening is Tiberius, Sempronius Gracchus, that's his, his full name, he leads a protest in Rome. So picture like, you know, one of those protests where people are like, what do we want? Farms. When do we want it? Now. Who needs to go? Latifundia, who, what needs to go? Latifundias. Well, the Senate pays a whole bunch of people to start a riot with the protesters. And they have Tiberius, the Tribune, and a lot of his followers killed in the riot. So the Senate is like, all right, problem solved. We killed the people that want to break up our latifundias, that want to stop us from, you know, paying the farmers to vote certain ways, problem solved. Mm, not quite. So, 
Tiberius's brother is a guy named Gaius Gracchus. Uh, so yes, they are the Gracchus brothers. Um, so Gaius gets elected to be the next tribune, and he keeps pressing on with Tiberius's cause. And he wants those poor farmers to move back to the country, back to the farms, and out of the city, so they stop getting, you know, the Senate stops corrupting the Republic. Well, once again, the Senate thinks, no, this is not going to happen. We're not changing our ways. Um, now, one of the, the really nice things that Gaius does as part of these protests is he has the government officials give out free wheat to the poor that couldn't afford it. Um, and while the poor is waiting online to get their free wheat, that's what Gaius would do is he'd give these speeches saying like, these stupid jerks in the Senate won't give the farmers their land back. They got it at a really cheap price. They're bribing people. We need to do something. So a lot of people join Gaius Gracchus's cause, which is following in his brother's footsteps. Well, again, the Senate feels threatened, so they have Gaius Gracchus murdered as well. So you see already, like, if the Senate feels threatened, they're going to kill people. This is, this is madness. Um, but welcome to Rome. So um, we have two tribunes dead, the two brothers, one after the other. Now, here's how things change a little bit. Um, there is a senator named Gaius Marius. He is not related to Gaius Gracchus. They just have the same first name. Um, so Gaius Marius is a military hero. That's how he got elected Senate. He was a great military leader. He gets elected to the Senate, and the assembly votes him in as the consul, as one of the two consuls for the year. Now, Marius grew up poor, but he gained power politically due to being a military hero. So the poor really liked them because he was one of them. He was a plebeian. And the military really liked him because he was this great general. And a lot of these people that support Marius felt that the rich had taken advantage of them all these years. So when Marius becomes consul, he has a lot of support. Now, here's the first thing Marius does. He sets up a professional army, meaning an army that that becomes your job. Um, there used to be a law in Rome that in order to be a legionary, a soldier, you had to own land. Well, Marius says, forget that. Anyone that wants to be in our military can join. Marius opens up the army to anyone that wants to join. This solves a major, major problem in Rome because... He offers the soldiers pay, land, because Rome is conquering all kinds of places, and things that they take from the enemies they defeat. And you know who signs up for a lot of these jobs? Those farmers that were stuck in the city. So this is a step in the right direction of stopping the corruption, because with the, some of the farmers joining the military, they now get land, they get paid, they get conquered people stuff. Um, they're no longer having to sell their rights to uh, sell their votes, not their rights, uh, sell their votes to the Senate. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of those out of work farmers sign up and they love Marius so much, they are more loyal to him than Rome itself. So they would put the person, Marius, ahead of the city-state of Rome. So here's where things go from there. Um, there's another general. His name is Lucius Cornelius Sulla. And he was given a really high ranking in the military. And Marius 
hated Sulla. Um, Marius has all the support. He's consul. Sulla gets this promotion, and Marius is like, no, Sulla's a jerk. I want Sulla to not get this promotion. So he wants the assembly to take away that military title. Now, Sulla is like, how dare he try and mess with my life and my job? So Sulla was in charge of a legion, one of those groups of 5,000 soldiers. So he brings that legion into Rome and takes control of the city by force. So let me just put this out there. You have Marius, the consul, has the support of all these people, and he says, no, Sulla's a jerk. Don't give him that promotion. And Sulla brings his soldiers and takes over the city of Rome by force. Now, this is going to lead to civil war. Marius and his troops, against Sulla and his troops, and Sulla wins. I know. So a lot of you probably didn't expect that coming to come. Sulla wins and names himself dictator. Now, um, in the Roman Republic system, there was a rule that in times of major crisis, one um, person could be named dictator to oversee Rome after the crisis or through the crisis. So when Sulla is victorious, he gets the Senate to name him dictator because Sulla says to them, we just had a civil war. I need all the power necessary to reunify the people of Rome. So he becomes dictator. And a dictator um, is kind of like um, a person that has absolute authority. Like they don't, there's no um, question of their um, rule. It's kind of like a king, but without the whole like being passed down, um, it doesn't get passed down a lot of times. Well, Sulla then pulls a fast one on the Senate. The Senate thought like, okay, we'll make Sulla a dictator. He'll lead us through this, this problem. Well, Sulla thinks the problems are in, were in Rome that were going on in Rome were due to the Senate. And what was happening is a lot of people that supported Sulla then went to Sulla and said, okay, we supported you. What are you going to do for me? And Sulla decided, I need to create more senators because then I can, I can help some of these people that are allies with me take control of the Senate. So by having the power of a dictator, he can just say, I am doubling the size of the Senate. So it goes from 300 to 600. So just by Sulla being dictator, and remember, the Senate thinks that he's doing it to reun reunify the people. And Sulla is like, yeah, I'm going to reunify the people by making more voices in the Senate. So he kind of dupes the Senate. And you might be thinking like, well, doesn't that make the Senate more powerful? There's more senators. Um, as a whole, maybe, but as individuals, it does not. And let me explain why. If you were a senator in Rome and there were only 300 senators, you had one 300th of power in the Senate. If it's doubled and there's now 600 people in the Senate, you now have one 600th power in the Senate. So your power went down. Why? Fractions. You know that from math. All right. Well, here comes the way famous Julius Caesar. Now, before we get into this guy, there is something I have to address. If we were in class, I guarantee someone in class would have said. I'm like, literally right now I'm raising my hand pretending to be you, which is kind of funny because you can't see me. You can only hear me when I'm doing videos like this. So someone in class would have asked this question. Is the Caesar salad named for Julius Caesar? And the answer is no. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Back in the 1920s, so about 100 years ago, in Brooklyn, 
Brooklyn, New York, there was a guy whose last name was Caesar, and in his restaurant, he created a salad and named it Caesar's Salad, and then it became really popular, and when an item starts off in one restaurant, other restaurants are like, oh, we need to have that too, and that's where Caesar Salad came from. Now, if you're like, but on my bottle of Caesar's dressing, it looks Roman. Well, that's just the company trying to market it and do like a play on the word Caesar. So Julius Caesar has nothing to do with salad. Okay, so had to had to get that out of the way because I'm sure some of you were curious. Well, here's what happens next. Sulla retires. And instead of the power going to two consuls, going back to the Republic of Two Consuls, um, the Senate decides, with Sulla stepping down as dictator, they couldn't really decide between three people for two positions. So the power goes to this group of three called a triumvirate. Now, a triumvirate is a group of three people with equal power. So let me just kind of set this up. Sulla was a dictator because he won that civil war, doubles the size of the Senate, rules Rome for a while, retires. The Senate now has to decide, like, who's going to run and everything, and then the assembly votes. Well, it was going to be really close um, between three people, so they all agree instead of having two consuls, they're going to share this power and be known as the first triumvirate. Now, they weren't called the first triumvirate at the time because people didn't think there'd be other ones, but there will be. Spoiler alert. So it's a group of three people with equal ruling power. So this first triumvirate is made up of Marcus Lincinius Crassus. That's, that's one guy, Crassus. Marcus Lincinius Crassus. Gnaeus Pompeius. Look at that name. That is a name. Gnaeus Pompeius, who um, is known as Pompey for short. Now, if some people are like, oh, is that like the volcano? Like the, the volcano that destroyed that city? No, 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 no. That city was called Pompeii. And you'll learn about that in this unit. Pompeii, city destroyed by a volcano. Pompey, part of this first triumvirate. And then the way famous Julius Caesar. So the first triumvirate, the group of three sharing ruling power are Crassus, Pompey, and Julius Caesar. Okay. So Julius Caesar and Pompey don't like each other at all. They argue a lot. So they decide, how can we stop fighting? So here's what happens. Pompey is arranged to be married to Julius Caesar's daughter, creatively named Julia Caesar. So let me, let me just kind of break this down because it can be confusing. You have Julius Caesar. He has a daughter, Julia Caesar, okay? Julia Caesar... Julia, uh, Caesar, the daughter, marries Pompey, Caesar's rival and part of the first triumvirate. And the reason why they did that, you might be thinking like, why would someone that you don't like marry your daughter? Here's why. Caesar and Pompey decided if they were family, maybe they wouldn't argue so much. Now you might be thinking like, what? Sometimes family argue more. That's true. But I guess they figured, like, Julius Caesar would be like, I'm going to be more tolerant of how I talk to Pompey because that's my daughter's husband. And Pompey would be like, I'm going to be more tolerant of how I talk to Julius Caesar because that's my father-in-law. Now, some of you might be thinking, like, what's the age difference? Uh, it's creepy. <laughs> There's a huge gap. Julius Caesar is like 20, Pompey is like 50. Yeah, I know. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, Crassus leads some troops conquering some places, and he dies in war. So then, when Crassus dies, Julius Caesar and Pompey become the two consuls. Well, Julius Caesar dies in childbirth, meaning 
she died giving birth to a baby because in ancient times they don't have hospitals and sterile equipment and there's no such thing as like ultrasounds and things like that like so like having a baby was very risky to your health in ancient times well here's what happens julius caesar was the military leader consul and he was conquering parts of gaul what is today france for the republic and pompey was alone in power in rome he was the military leader well there's gonna be an event that happens pompey is gonna get murdered leaving caesar the only one um pompey gets murdered in egypt and it's a crazy story of how it happens i'll kind of talk about it in the next set of notes but i'll give you the long story short so once julius caesar died um Pompey and Caesar are like, well, there's no reason why we have to like each other anymore. So it kind of starts another civil war. And essentially what happens, long story short, Pompey gets uh, murdered in Egypt by the pharaoh of Egypt at the time, uh, Ptolemy the 14th. Uh, remember, so you remember Alexander the Great? Um, and when he died... Ptolemy took over Egypt. Well, now it's been, there's been 13 other Ptolemies, and now it's Ptolemy the 14th. So Ptolemy the 14th is a little kid. Not a little, I, I take that back. He's like around your age. Not exactly Pharaoh uh, ruling age. Um, and you're going to learn the details of what happened in uh, the next set of notes. But long story short is... He kills Pompey to try and impress Rome, but it ends up leading to more drama and chaos. So Julius Caesar is now the only one left in power. So the Senate is like, oh my gosh, he's going to probably try and make himself dictator or worse what if he makes himself king that would be nuts so the senate is like oh my gosh julius caesar is going to make it so that we don't have a lot of power so they say to julius caesar your one year term of consul is up because they were that's what was happening is like the term of consul was up and they were afraid julius caesar wasn't going to give up power and he was going to name himself like king or even or dictator um dictator would be bad for senate king, king would like being no more republic so they say to julius caesar your time as consul is up come back to rome oh and by the way those legions that you're in charge of you're not in charge of them anymore now julius caesar is like oh you want me to come back to rome with my troops okay um, you want me to break up these legions? I'm, I said that wrong. Let me back that up. He's like, you want me to break up these, these legions and me not be in charge? No, no, no. Instead, I'm bringing them into the city. So he brings his troops into the city and he puts his troops to work. So Caesar had established new colonies, meaning, whoa, 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 whoa. I hit the wrong button and things went crazy. Let me go back to where I was. Okay. He establishes new colonies. He conquers new lands for the people. He gave land to the poor by draining the swamps. Now, that's not like the political term of today. He literally drained swamps to create new land for, for like homes and stuff. Um, he built roads and buildings, and he held gladiatorial games. Now, you know the Romans love their gladiatorial games. So Caesar is like, you want me to break up my legion? No way, man. Everybody loves me, and my troops are doing some good work in Rome. Now, the Senate was like, oh my gosh, Caesar, um, your consul time is up. And Julius Caesar was like, no, no, no. We just had civil war. Therefore, maybe it's time that you make me a dictator. Because the last time there was Roman civil war, you need to make somebody a dictator, just like before. Now... Another thing he does is Julius Caesar 
with this power, like it's one of those things where, like he's not officially named dictator, but he is so beloved. The assembly is like, we don't care what the Senate wants. We're going to support you. He doubles the size of the Senate again. So instead of there being 600 senators, Caesar makes it so there's 1,200 senators. So if those 600 people didn't like Julius Caesar, by doubling the size of the Senate, he now made it so that it's even. 600 senators don't like him. 600 new senators love him. So this also makes each individual senator weaker because instead of being one six hundredth of a voice, each individual senator is now one twelve hundredth of a voice. So those old school senators are like Caesar as like this kind of power. This just proves we need to get rid of him because this is insane. Who knows? He's going to make himself king, and then we're not going to have power anymore because if there's a king, there's no senate, there's no assembly, there's nothing. Well, here's another thing Julius Caesar does. Julius Caesar says to the people, he says, I see those tax collectors, those publicans, ripping you off, and the senate looking the other way because they don't want their corruption to be exposed. So Julius Caesar makes it illegal for those publicans to overcharge the people and has them sent to jail, the ones that were doing it. So the people really love Caesar. He also makes a new calendar, and we still use it today. In fact, the month of July is named for Julius Caesar. Okay, well... The Senate then calls Julius Caesar into uh, the chambers to speak with them. And when he arrived on March 15th, which is known as the Ides of March, and I'll talk about that in a second, 27 of those senators stabbed him to death on the floor of the Senate. Now, there's a lot I need to explain. So... Julius Caesar gets called to the Senate, and Julius Caesar thinks, like, oh, they're probably going to thank me for what a great job I'm doing. Um, and if you were one of the senators that supported Caesar, you were like, yeah, we're going to thank Caesar because he's great. But 27 of these senators got together and said, we need to kill Julius Caesar or else we're probably going to lose our political power. So what happens is this. When Caesar walks into um, the Senate building, he's doing one of those, like, you know, where you shake hands, the like, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Kind of thing. Well, 27 of them surround him, take out daggers, and stab him to death on the floor of the Senate. Now, some of these senators were old friends of Julius Caesar. Now, this is where a term that we use today comes from. When a friend has betrayed you, we call that act of betrayal backstabbing. Like, oh, you know, this person betrayed me. They're such a backstabber. And that term comes from this story because Julius Caesar's own former friends literally stabbed him in the back. So that's where that term comes from. Now, here's what happens next. The Senate thought everybody is going to love the fact that they killed Julius Caesar because the Senate thinks they're going to be like, Julius Caesar was going to name himself king. He had the power of a dictator. You're going to be so happy we did what we did because we restored the Republic. But what actually happens is the people are like, how dare you kill Julius Caesar? He was the best. He did all this stuff for us. You now are the ones that must die. And Rome turns against the senators who killed Julius Caesar. Now, Caesar has a will. 
So what, you know, like if someone dies, there's a document that says like what they will leave them. Julius Caesar had that. And everyone thought he was going to name his good friend, Mark Antony, not Mark Anthony with an H, Mark Antony, no H. Um, They thought that he was going to name Mark Antony the next person to kind of step in. But he actually names his great nephew. Now, I don't mean like this person was outstanding, meaning like, like a, like relationship wise. So like um, this person that was his great nephew, Octavian, Julius Caesar is Octavian's great uncle. So he says, Octavian, this person that has no experience and is like 20 years old, he's going to be the new leader of Rome. And Octavian is like, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done this before. So Octavian agrees to form a second triumvirate, a second group of three people to rule Rome together. And this second triumvirate is made up of Mark Antony, that top general uh, from ancient Rome and good friend of Julius Caesar, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who was a top officer in one of Caesar's legions, and then, of course, Octavian. Now, the whole reason why the story of Julius Caesar is so famous is because of William Shakespeare. Now, William Shakespeare wrote a play called Julius Caesar, and it kind of over dramatized some of these things. So in a famous part of the play, he has a soothsayer walk up to Julius Caesar and say, beware the Ides of March. And Ides is a Latin word that means middle. So watch out for the middle of March. So in the play, that's when, um, and in, in, in reality, that's when Caesar was stabbed. Um, they also have some very dramatic stuff. Like one of the, the former friends of Julius Caesar who killed him was this guy, Brutus. Uh, Brutus and Cassius were like the two main leaders of this group that betrayed Caesar. And in the Shakespeare play, one of what Caesar's last words were is he looks at Brutus as Caesar's dying. And he says to Brutus, et tu Brute, which is Latin for you too, Brutus, or like, and you, Brutus, meaning like, I can't believe you were the ones that did this. Now, um, it's one thing to hear me talk about Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. We need some like legit British people to talk about Julius Caesar. So this is the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they're going to give you a quick little plot um, outline of what the play Julius Caesar is about as made by Shakespeare. Hi, I'm Rawika and I am the assistant director on Julius Caesar. We're in Rome, it's 44 BC and it's the festival of Lupercal, which is this wild fertility festival, big party in Rome. We have Julius Caesar, who is processing through the streets of Rome to celebrate his recent military triumph. And on his procession through the streets of Rome, he comes across a soothsayer, a soothsayer who says, Beware the Ides of March. The Ides of March is just a day in the middle of March, according to the Roman calendar. We think it's about the 15th of March. Julius Caesar, who is super powerful, thinks, I don't need to pay any attention to him. Off he goes. Brutus and Cassius, two noblemen, two friends, two uh, politicians, they're involved in government, hear that Julius Caesar is possibly being crowned king. And they, re- they don't have kings in Rome. They haven't had kings in Rome for 500 years. So they're pretty worried that one man is going to become king and then become sole ruler of Rome. And they think that's just too much power for one person. And that's not good for everybody. We need to, we need to get rid of Julius Caesar. And we need to make sure we uphold the Republic. We have shared rulers in Rome. They plot to kill him. Caesar hasn't been listening to the warnings. And Oh, let me just stop this for a second and explain some things. So one of the reasons why Julius Caesar is able to double the size of the Senate is when Pompey dies, they don't name another person to be consul along with Caesar. So he's the only one that's consul, which is why I was saying he's kind of like a dictator at that point. Um, Oh, look, the statue's like looking at this lady like, 
Keep going. You're telling a good story. Okay. Sorry. And on the Ides of March, everybody goes to the capital, business as usual. And as they start the day's business, the daggers come out and the conspirators assassinate Caesar. We think he had about 33 stab wounds, so they really, they really went for it. Caesar's dead. The conspirators think, great, we've saved Rome. We're going to run through the streets crying liberty, freedom. We're going to have shared power again. It's all going to be great. But it's not. Mark Antony, really good friend of Caesar's, fantastic, uh, fantastic soldier, very, um, uh, very famous for being a great military leader, um, has seen the dead Julius Caesar and basically plots revenge on Brutus and Cassius. And so what he decides to do is to team up forces with somebody called Lepidus, who, is, um, uh, who had a strong army, and also somebody called Octavius Caesar. Octavius. She's talking about Octavian. That's the same person. Caesar was Julius Caesar's nephew and had actually been appointed as his heir. And they go to war with Brutus and Cassius, who have fled out of Rome, quite a long way out of Rome, actually. We think about two, 300 miles outside of Rome. And they have a big battle. We see them fighting against each other. And sadly for Brutus and Cassius, it doesn't go their way. And they end up killing themselves when they realise that all is lost. Antony, Octavius, they're victorious in the end. And they are going to be the new leaders of Rome. Luckily, we've also got... And new leaders in Rome along with Lepidus. So, oh... She's not done. Sorry. Antony and Cleopatra. So you can see what happens 10 years later. Yeah. The next set of notes talks about Cleopatra. Super scandalous set of notes. Um, but that'll be for the next time you have social studies. All right. So that takes care of the Roman leadership notes. As you can see, lots of drama, lots of action, lots of different people. Um, yeah. So here's the awkward turnoff button moment. Every time. It's just awkward because I click it and then it's like, oh, now I will stop it. 